Good evening. My name is Jeff Bradshaw. On behalf of the Interpreter Foundation, Book of Mormon Central and Fair Latter-day Saints, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to each of you. We'll now have our opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I think that we are able to attend this devotional tonight, and we're grateful for the opportunity to learn about the gospel and to learn about the restoration and, and early church leaders. And Please help us to have the spirit and to learn and to increase our faith in everything we do and uh, to remember thee and thy son, Jesus Christ. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Welcome to this evening's fireside. There's the boy I can trust. Dennis and Lot Harris's first person account of the conspiracy of Nauvoo and events surrounding Joseph Smith's last charge to the 12 apostles. The presenter this evening is Jeffrey M. Bradshaw who received a PhD in cognitive science from the University of Washington and is a senior research scientist at the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition in Pensacola, Florida. His professional writings have explored a wide range of topics in human and machine intelligence. He has been the recipient of several awards and patents and has been an advisor for initiatives in science, defense, space, and industry worldwide. Jeff has also written detailed commentaries on the book of Moses and Genesis chapters 1 through 11, as well as on temple themes in the scriptures. The final days of Joseph Smith's life have been of great interest to people for more than a century and a half. A well-known account from early church history describes how, in the spring of 1844, two young men, Dennis and Lot Harris and Robert Scott, helped protect Joseph Smith from some of those plotting against his life. In tonight's presentation, Jeff will present new research on these events, including on the role of William Law, erstwhile first counselor in the first presidency of the church. Jeff will also discuss Dennison Harris's account of his subsequent role as a firsthand witness to events that appear to have taken place on the morning of March 26, 1844, just before the meeting in which Joseph Smith gave his last charge to the Quorum of the Twelve and rolled the kingdom off his shoulders onto theirs in the presence of the Council of Fifty. I hope that listening to Jeff's lecture this evening will prove intellectually stimulating and spiritually uplifting. Critical to the operation of the church today is the orderly bestowal of priesthood keys that occurred during Joseph Smith's life and made it possible for Brigham Young and members of the Quorum of the Twelve to continue leading the church after the martyrdom of Joseph and his brother Hiram. I testify that those, church, that those keys are active in the church today and are the keys under which priesthood functions. Thank you for being here this evening. The uh, title of this presentation is There's the Boy I Can Trust, Dennis and Lot Harris's First Person Account of the Conspiracy of Nauvoo and Events Surrounding Joseph Smith's Last Charge. We'll begin the discussion with an overview of the last charge. The word last charge is in quotes because, as we will see, Joseph Smith seems to have repeated a similar message on multiple occasions. Then we'll describe the centerpiece for tonight's presentation, the verbal statement of Denison Lot Harris. The statement tells of Denison's role in helping protect Joseph Smith from dissidents plotting against his life in what is commonly called the Conspiracy of Nauvoo. It also gives Dennison's almost completely unknown account of his subsequent role as first-hand witness to events related to Joseph Smith's last charge to the Twelve. I will end with an epilogue and a conclusion about the importance of the events we'll talk about tonight. For starters, now let's watch a short church video, now some decades old, that dramatized some of the known happenings during the last charge events as they were then understood. Last speech that Joseph gave us before his death. On the face of the earth. These principles and this priesthood and power belong to this great and last dispensation, which God in heaven has set his hand to establish in the earth. I have sealed upon your heads every key, every power, every principle which the Lord has sealed upon my head. The keys of the kingdom are planted on the earth, to be taken away no more, forever. Brethren, you have many storms to pass through, and many, 
Many sore trials await you. If you are called upon to lay down your lives, die like men. Should you have to walk right into danger and even the jaws of death, fear no evil. Jesus Christ has died for you. Now, round up your shoulders and stand under it like men. For the Lord is going to let me rest a while. The words Joseph Smith spoke in the video we've just seen were drawn from a statement composed by Elder Orson Hyde, who was present at the last charge meeting. Elder Hyde brought the statement up for discussion in a meeting of the Council of Fifty on 25th of March, 1845, one day short of a year after the last charge meeting is thought to have occurred. It appears that the first knowledge, public knowledge of this document came through the research of Ronald K. Esplin, who gave a marvelous presentation in this fireside series on a related subject a few weeks ago. Through the gist of the words in Elder, though the gist of the words in Elder Hyde's document are confirmed by other statements of the Twelve, there are three aspects of the story that should be clarified. One, the reports by Elder Hyde and other members of the Twelve surrounding Joseph Smith's last charge do not reflect a single event, but rather a series of events that occurred as the prophet met frequently with them throughout the spring of 1844. Two, evidence suggests that the speech reported by Elder Hyde was not given to the Twelve alone, but almost certainly to the entire Council of Fifty. Three, Elder Hyde's report shows that the meeting was not only a solemn occasion, but was also a moment of jubilation for the prophet. Elder Hyde reported, quote, after he had thus spoken about rolling the responsibility of bearing the church onto the shoulders of the twelve, he continued to walk the floor saying, quote, since I have rolled the burthen off my shoulders, I feel as light as a cork. I feel that I am free. I thank my God for this deliverance, end of quote. By decision of the Council of Fifty, Elder Hyde's draft document was never finished and published. Why not? Well, for one thing, Alexander Alba and Richard, Richard L. N. Holzapol suggest that the answer may lie in the fact that those who were invited to attend the private meetings were instructed to remain silent about the details. For example, at a meeting held on March 10, 1844, those attending were told that Joseph required perfect secrecy of them regarding the things that were, they had learned and were being taught. This possibly explains why William Clayton and Wilfred Woodruff, both of whom were thorough and detailed diarists, did not record any of the particulars regarding the last charge meeting in their diary records, end of quote. On the other hand, Ron Esplin has emphasized the attitude of Brigham Young on the question of publishing Elder Hyde's statement. Brigham, Brigham said he didn't care, quote, whether the world knew the authority and power of the Twelve or not. When the time comes, they shall feel our power, and we shall not try to prove it to them, end of quote. The most important of the events surrounding the last charge was mentioned only in passing by Elder Hyde. That event was the conferral of the keys of the sealing power, a power that had been jointly held by Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram after Oliver Cowdery's departure. As Ron Esplin pointed out in his earlier presentation, had these keys held by Joseph and Hiram not been given to Brigham Young before the martyrdom, they would have been lost to the earth until they could be restored again by heavenly messengers. In an 1845 proclamation to the church, Elder Partley P. Parley P. Pratt described this sacred and essential event, which occurred on a separate occasion sometime prior to the meeting with the Council of Fifty. Elder Pratt wrote, quote, Joseph Smith proceeded to confer on Elder Young, the president of the Twelve, the keys of the sealing power as conferred in the last days by the spirit and power of Elijah in order to seal the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest the whole earth should be smitten with a curse. The last key of this priesthood is the most sacred of all and pertains exclusively to the first presidency of the church, without whose sanction and approval or authority, no sealing blessing shall be administered pertaining to the things of the resurrection and the life to come. We possess several firsthand accounts of the meetings in which Joseph Smith spoke of how the responsibilities for the kingdom had now been transferred to the twelve. However, because none of them were written until several months afterward, and since all of them were recorded by parties with potential self-interest due to their roles as participants, some have expressed frustration and doubt in our day as to whether or not the incidents really happened as they've been reported. For example, a member of an online discussion group on Reddit wrote the following. I hope I don't come across as argumentative, 
but I'm hoping we have something other than the later recollections of those who had an incentive to remember a secret meeting where Joseph gave them, rather than their competitors to church leadership, special authority. It seems rather convenient to me that these recollections occur as their authority to lead the church is challenged. Nobody can remember a date. Nobody can provide meeting minutes, despite the fact that the meeting minutes were religiously kept in other circumstances. I mean, we have loads of minutes from the Nauvoo High Council, the Council of 50, Relief Society, ceilings, second anointings, endowments, etc., but nothing at all from the time when Joseph provided the element necessary for the work to continue after he died. If there's nothing we know of, I suppose I have to live with that fact. I wanted to see if anyone else knew something I missed. Apparently not. Fortunately, there is an account of these events that addresses some of the questions raised by this reader, the verbal statement of Dennis and Lot Harris. We'll now discuss the circumstances of the statement, corroboration of some of its details, and then provide a narrative of the events he described. First, a few words about Dennison himself. Dennison Lot Harris, 1825 to 1885, was a son of Emer and Deborah Lot Harris and nephew of Book of Mormon witness Martin Harris. He gathered with his parents to Ohio, Missouri, and Illinois. He was 19 years old in March 1844 when the events in Nauvoo recounted in a statement seemed to have taken place. Harris came west with the Saints to Utah in 1852, served a mission to the Navajo in 1854, participated in the Echo Canyon campaign of the 1857 and 58 Utah War, and brought provisions to the handcart companies on three different occasions. At, after a time of living in Virgin City in Paragona, he moved to Monroe. At the age of 52, he was set apart as the Bishop of Monroe and served until his death in 1885. In his statement, we learn that he appears to have been a first-hand witness not only to meetings of the conspiracy of Nauvoo, but also the statements surrounding the, the events surrounding the meetings where Joseph Smith gave his last charge to the Quorum of the Twelve. Although other contemporaries testified of having heard the prophet repeat similar words on other occasions, Dennis and Lot Harris is currently the only outside observer who claims to have heard Joseph Smith speak of the event on the very morning it occurred, possibly just prior to the last charge meeting itself. Although Dennison's account was not recorded until decades after the event he reports took place, I find his description both a good fit to the known circumstances and not implausible with respect to aspects of the situation for which we have no other direct informant. Speaking of the portion of Dennison's account that tells of the conspiracy of Nauvoo, Brian C. Hales, who recently presented a virtual fireside on Doctrine and Covenants 132, observed, as a historical document, the account has been largely dismissed because it came late and because it contained information that was not verified by corroborative sources. Notwithstanding this general reaction, my research indicates that its reliability may be greater than previously assumed." End of quote. What were the circumstances in which the statement was given? Just prior to the morning session of the Ephraim Utah State Conference on Sunday, 15th of May, 1881, Dennis and Lot Harris, Bishop of the Monroe, Utah Ward, approached the First Presidency Counselor, Joseph F. Smith, with a request. For nearly four decades, Bishop Harris had held in confidence information about his role as a 19-year-old boy in two important incidents that had taken place in the spring of 1844 in Nauvoo. At last, he felt it was time to relate these stories to President Smith so they could be preserved permanently as part of the history of the church. Accordingly, after the morning meeting, Bishop Harris accompanied President Smith, Elder Franklin Spencer, and Secretary to the First Presidency, George F. Gibbs, to the home of Ephraim South Ward Bishop, Carl N. C. N. Darius. Over a meeting meal between conference sessions, Bishop Harris related his stories while Brother Gibbs took notes in Pittman's shorthand, expressing subdued frustration with the constrained circumstances under which he was obliged to do his work, probably missing his meal. Gibbs commented, quote, as the afternoon meeting had been announced to commence half an hour earlier than usual, so as to give President Taylor and party an opportunity to make Moroni and Fountain Green that evening on the way home, the time at our disposal to hear Brother H also to eat dinner was not sufficient to enable him to do justice to it. He told it in his own way and had to hurry at that, end of quote from Gibbs. A typescript was made after Gibbs returned to his office in Salt Lake City. Thanks to the assistance of Jay Burrup of the Church History Library, who had previously cataloged the Joseph F. Smith papers, a thorough search was performed in an effort to locate a manuscript behind the typescript. 
No manuscript was found in the Do Joseph Smith, Smith papers. So Burrup concluded that Gibbs must have typed the Harris statement directly from the shorthand notes and then disposed of them immediately thereafter. Now let's talk about the reliability of the statement. Most of the account is devoted to the story of the conspiracy meetings. Circumstantial evidence for this story is compelling, and the frequency with which it is cited by historians attests to its widespread acceptance as part of the genuine history of the church. On the other hand, the remembrance of Denison related to Joseph Smith's last charge is very brief, seemingly occurring just as the group was finishing up their noon meal and rushing to get to the afternoon session of conference on time. Some details are lacking, and until recently, the story was unknown and had not been seriously investigated. Here's what George Gibbs recorded, quote, Brother Harris then related the following circumstances in connection with Joseph's giving the 12 their endowments, quote, this little circumstance took place a few months after the thing I've related, meaning the conspiracy meetings, perhaps two or three weeks. I do not now remember. I did not rivet dates on my mind, said Dennison. I was passing Joseph's brick, brick building, which was used for a store, when Brother Willard Richards came out and beckoned me. As we approached each other, he said, good morning, Brother Harris, and shook hands with me. I was on my wagon and thought as though he wanted to chat. He walked along and I drove on. He walked alongside my wagon. It was an ox team I had, but I asked him if he was going my way and if he would ride. He said, yes, if you please. He got up and rode. As soon as he was seated on the wagon, he said, I have a message for you. Brother Joseph wanted me to come and see you. As soon as he saw you coming, he remarked, there, brethren, we are all right now. The time has come. There is the man I want. There's the boy I can depend upon and trust. Brother Richards, will you go and see him and tell him what I want? Then Brother Richards told me that Brother Joseph had met in that building with most of the 12 and that they had been waiting for someone that Joseph could depend on to this assist them. He told me that Joseph desired me to drive round to the river where he, Brother Richards, would meet me with barrels and buckets to assist him to get some water up to the house in which the brethren had gathered. The Brother Joseph wanted to give them, the 12, their endowments. I went to the river according to request and found Brother Richards there with barrels and buckets. We loaded up the wagon and drove up the house the back way. The 12 were on the porch above with block and tackle with which they drew the barrels of water up. Joseph was then was with them and assisted. Brother Joseph said to me, this day I am going to roll this kingdom off my shoulders onto the shoulders of these my brethren for them to preach the gospel and gather Israel and build up the kingdom upon the foundation which I have laid. For I shall not be known among the people for many years or for 20 years. I'm going to rest. And these, my brethren, the 12, have got to preach the gospel and gather Israel, etc. In answer to a question, Brother Harris said, Joseph was then addressing himself to me while the 12 stood around him on the porch. He then said to me, you are the only witness on the earth to what I am about to do. I wanted you as a witness, and I've been waiting for you. When Denison spoke of being the only witness to what the prophet was about to do, he no, no, no doubt meant the only external witness present on that particular day, independent of those standing around the prophet who might have been accused by apostates of colluding to fabricate the account of this incident. Denison's descriptions of the event are consistent with the location of the brick, red brick store near the river. Water could have been brought to the upper story for drinking and also for washing ordinances. At that time, the initiatory ordinance of washing was performed in large tubs, hence a relatively large quantity of water was required. The buckets were dipped into the barrels in order to fill the tubs. The mention of a porch where Joseph and the Twelve were standing creates a bit of a mystery. In modern English, a porch is a covered shelter projecting in front of the entrance of a building. But Denison was talking about a porch on the back of the building, near the river, and there is nothing resembling the modern description of a porch on either the upper or lower story of the back or front of the red brick store, as is clear from the images shown here. But from this floor plan of the building, it is easy to understand that the porch mentioned by Harris must have been a landing at the top of the stairway that led to the upper story of the building. It was used as a storeroom. In the photo at right, you can see the view of the Mississippi out the window. The average distance between the river and the store has changed considerably since Joseph Smith's time. The hallway at the top of the stairs was opposite a door which opened into Joseph Smith's private office with its window overlooking the Mississippi River. An enlarged photo of the name plaque over the office door is shown on the upper right. When the upper story was to be used for the performance of temple ordinances, this office in the back of the building would be fitted up for washings and anointings. 
washings for sisters were performed nearby the Joseph Smith Mansion House. Going down the hall, the porch or landing or storeroom would be on the left. The rest of what we now call the endowment would be given in the larger assembly room at the front of the building. The saints did the best they could with limited space and means, dividing up the room into different areas, decorating the room, and bringing in trees and bushes to represent a garden. At the October 21st, uh, 2021 General Conference, President Nelson recalled that Joseph had told Brigham, quote, this is not arranged right, but we've done the best we could under the circumstances in which we are placed, and I wish you to take this matter in hand and organize and systematize all these ceremonies. Here are some of the figures illustrating the block and tackle arrangement mentioned by Dennison in his description of how the barrels of water were lifted to the second story, second floor landing. In the smaller image of the block and tackle arrangements at right, barrels such as those that would have been used by Dennison are depicted. Overall, the description given by Dennison gives confidence to the idea that he was familiar with both the process of bringing water up to the top floor of the red brick store and the general arrangement of the floor plan. But do we have any corroboration of the idea that the prophet, prophet sometimes asked young men to help fetch water for endowments? Interestingly, James H. Rollins recalled a similar experience to that of Dennison. Quote, during the spring and summer of 1844, previous to his death, the prophet told me to assist in carrying water and other commodities to the room above the store. Afterwards, I found out it was to give endowments to some of the brethren. End of quote from Rollins. Having discussed the circumstances for the statement and the corroboration of material details, we'll now trace Dennison's narrative of the events. Though he gave no specific dates in his account, we can now be quite confident in mapping the events he describes to its specific latter calendar dates. The first event that Dennison mentioned would have taken place a few dates, days before March 3rd, 1844. He relates, quote, in the spring of 1844, I was invited by Austin A. Cowles, who was at that time a member of the High Council, to attend a secret meeting. I was also asked to invite my father. The meeting was to be held on the following Sunday at William Law's Brick House. There was another young man by the name of Robert Scott who was also invited by William Law to attend the same meeting. Being intimate friends, we found out during the week that both of us had been invited to attend the same meeting. I told my father about this meeting, and he went immediately to Brother Joseph, who lived some two and a half miles distant, and informed him of the same. Joseph told my father to send the boys to him, but for him, my father, not to go to the meeting, nor to... The young man referred to as my intimate friend, and I went to and saw Brother Joseph. After telling him about the invitation, he instructed us to go to the meeting and pay strict attention and do the best we could to learn and remember all the proceedings. The first conspiracy meeting was almost certainly held March 3rd. Playing together and working up the system and planning how to get at things the best. They were opposed to the doctrine of plurality of wives, which was the cause of their conspiring against Joseph. On being asked who were present, Brother Harris said, as near as I can recollect, William and Wilson Law, Austin A. Cowles, the Higs Higbees, Francis and Chauncey, Robert Foster and his brother, and two of the Hickses. This was their first meeting. They were plotting how and what they could do against Joseph. Some others were also present, uh, Dennis reported. In a public meeting on March 7th, Joseph spoke out against the efforts of Francis M. Higby to carry a lawsuit against Hiram for having seven, several spiritual wives to Carthage. And things also took a turn for the worse with Robert and Charles Foster. Historian Andrew Hedges writes that Joseph Smith, quote, had good reason to be concerned with their activities. Anti-Mormon sentiment in Hancock County had reached near fever pitch by March 1844. The trouble stirred up by Higby and the Fosters threatened to undermine the goodwill Joseph was trying to build with Governor Ford and with anti-Mormons in the area, leaving him no other option but to roundly and publicly condemn their activities, end of quote from Hedges. The reports back, brought back to Joseph Smith about their secret participation in the conspiracy meeting increased in his under, understanding of their threat. The second conspiracy meeting was on March 10th. Dennison said, quote, the next Sunday we attended again, having received an invitation to come back. And when they told us to come again on the next Sabbath, they told us to keep quiet what had passed at the meeting and say nothing to our fathers or anybody else. We reported to Joseph the proceedings as far as they went. Joseph said, boys, come and see me next Sunday morning and go on to the meeting. We did so. They went on with their arrangements and agreed to make further arrangements during the week. 
they worked this up considerably that Sunday and gave us an invitation to attend the following week. The next day, March 11th, Joseph Smith presided at the first organizational meeting for the Council of 50. The members were strictly enjoined to keep the existence and proceedings of the meetings of the Council strictly confidential. On Wednesday the 13th, the Council of 50 met again. And the next day, March 14th, the Council of 50 met yet again. On March 15th or 16th, Abiathar B. Williams and Marinus G. Eaton were approached by Joseph H. Jackson, Robert D. Foster, and Chauncey L. Higby with accusations against Joseph Smith. These included the insinuation that the prophet had tried to seduce Foster's wife. Williams and Eaton were strongly urged to join a secret meeting, probably tomorrow evening, but as it was not decided, he could not say positively at this time, end of quote. Before going to the third meeting, Dennison and Robert met with Joseph Smith. Dennison said, quote, Joseph told us to go again, this being the third Sunday, and was desirous that we should see and learn all that took place. For this day, said he, this will be your last meeting. This will be the last time they will admit you into their council, and they will come to some determination. But be sure, he continued, that you make no covenants nor enter into any, any obligation whatever with that party. Be strictly reserved and make no promise either to conspire against me or any portion of the community. Be silent and do not take part in any deliberations. That day we were received and welcomed by William Law and Austin Cowles. We passed up the alley. On each side there were men with guns and bayonets on them. And when we got to the door, there were men on guard, armed in the same way. Before we went to this meeting, Brother Joseph said to us, quote, Boys, this day will be their last meeting, and they may shed your blood but I hardly think they will do as you are so young, but they may. If they do, I will be a lion in their path. Don't flinch. If you have to die, die like men. You will be martyrs to the cause and your crown can be no greater. But said he, again, I hardly think they will shed your blood. Dennison gave this report of the third secret conspiracy meeting. Quote, we went, as I've said, to the house of meeting and passed the guards. There was a great deal of counseling going on with each other. And every little while, Austin Cowles would come and sit by my side and put his arm around my neck to ascertain how I felt with regard to the proceedings. And at the same time, William Law would do the same with Robert Scott. They talked about Joseph, denouncing him and accusing him. We told them that we did not know anything about against Joseph or the things they were charging him with, that we were only young men and therefore had nothing to say. They would then try to convince us by relating things to us against him. But we told them that we knew nothing about them and did not understand them that we'd been reared in the church and had always esteemed Brother Joseph highly. Robert had been reared by Brother Law and had been a neighbor, and I had been a neighbor of Austin Cowles, and consequently they esteemed us as friends, and we did them. They continued to persuade us, we being the only ones who did not sympathize with their proceedings, but they failed to convert us. Finally, they went on to, the, to administer the oath to, ones, to those present, each man was required to come to the table and hold up the Bible in his right hand when, when Brother Higby would say, Are you ready? When the man being sworn answered yes, he would say, You solemnly swear before God and all holy angels, and these your brethren by whom you are surrounded, that you will give your life, your liberty, your influence, your all for the destruction of Joseph Smith and his party. So help you God. Each one was sworn in that way, numbering in the neighborhood of 200 persons, and they were all sworn before we were called upon. There were also three women brought in who testified that Joseph Smith and others, Hiram among them, had tried to seduce them in the spiritual marriage and wanted them for their wives, and also they made the oath before this justice, after which they were escorted out of the room by way of the back door. After all in the room had taken the oath, but Robert and me, we were labored with by those two brethren, William Law and Austin Cowles, they sat with us together side by side, with Brother Cowles on one side and Brother Law on the other. Their arguments were to try to convince us that Joseph was wrong, that he was in transgression, that he was a fallen prophet and that the church would be destroyed except action be taken at once against him. A strong one, one that would tell, etc. We told them that we were young, that we were not members of the High Council, and that we knew nothing at all about their charges. They then told us that Joseph had read the revelation on celestial marriage to the high council and that Joseph had instructed them in this revelation and that he had tried to make them believe it. After laboring with us in this way, with the view of trying to get us to take the oath, we told them that we would not do it. We could not do it. They then told us that they were combining and entering into a conspiracy for the protection and salvation of the church and that if we refused to take the oath, they would have to kill us. 
they could not, they said, let us go out with the information that we had gained because it would not be safe to do so. And someone spoke up and said, dead men tell no tales. They gathered around us and after threatening, they perceived that we could not be frightened into it. They again commenced to persuade and advise us in this way. Boys, do as we have done. You are young and we will not have anything to do in this affair, but we want that you should keep it a secret and act with us. We then told them that we positively could not. They then said, if we did not yield to their requirement, they would have to shed our blood. They went so far as to start us downstairs in charge of two armed men armed with guns, with bayonets. And William and Wilson Law, Austin Cowles, and one of the Fosters started downstairs into the cellar. And there they said they would cut our throats if we refused to take the oath. We told them positively that we would have to die then because we could not receive the oath, but that we desired to be turned loose. They said they could not turn us loose with the information we'd received because it would not be safe to do it. They then walked us off with one man on each side of us, armed with sword and bowie knife, and two men behind us with loaded guns, cocked, with bayonets on them. We were started to the cellar, but we had not gone more than about 15 feet when someone cried out, hold on, let's talk this matter over. We were stopped. Then they commenced to counsel among themselves, and I distinctly remember one of them saying that our fathers knew where we were, and that if we, ever, if we never returned, at once, it would at once cause suspicion and lead to trouble. They became very uneasy about it, for if they shed our blood, it would be dangerous for them, as it was known where we were. Finally, they concluded to let us go if we would keep our mouths shut. We were escorted out, and then they hated to let us go. They took us toward the river and still cautioned us about being silent and keeping secret everything we'd seen and heard. For, said they, if we opened our mouths about it, they would kill us anywhere, that they would consider it their duty to kill us, whenever or wherever the opportunity afforded, either by night or by day. I told them that it would be to our interest and to our peace and safety never to mention it to anybody. They said they were glad that we could see that. And after warning us in strong terms and before the guard left us, I saw Brother Joseph's hand from under the bank of the river. He was beckoning us to him. They turned back, but were yet watching us and listening to us. And one of us said, let us go toward the river. The guard made answer and said, yes, you better go to the river. With this, we started off on the run and we ran past where Brother Joseph was and Brother John Scott was with him. He was one of his bodyguards. They slipped around the bank and came down to the same point where we were. And these men, the guard, went back. We all walked down the river quite a piece, nearly a quarter of a mile, nearly opposite Joseph's store under the bank near Joseph's residence. It was in the afternoon. We got in a little kind of wash, and we were inside Joseph's enclosure where the board fence came down to the river. Joseph said, let us sit down here. We sat down. Joseph said, boys, we saw the danger you were in. We were afraid you could not get out alive, but we're thankful that you got off. He then asked us to relate the results of the meeting. We told him all that had happened. We also told him the names of those who were there. After Joseph heard us, he looked very solemn indeed, and he said, O oh, brethren, you do not know what this will terminate in. He looked very solemn, and not being able to control himself, he broke right out. Brother Scott rose, and putting his arms around Brother Joseph's neck, said, O oh, Brother Joseph, Brother Joseph, do you think they're going to kill you? And they fell on each other's neck and wept bitterly for some time, and we all wept. After Joseph recovered himself, Brother John repeated the same question. Brother Joseph lifted Brother John's arm from off his neck and said, I fully comprehend it, but he would not say that he was going to be killed. But he said in the conversation, Brethren, I'm going to leave you. I shall not be with you long. It will not be many months until I shall have to go. Brother John said, Brother Joseph, are you going to be slain? He never answered, but he still felt very sorrowful. After considerably com considerable conversation, Joseph said that he would go away and would not be known among the people for 20 years or upwards. Finally, he said, I shall go to rest, but he did not say a word about dying. Before leaving, Joseph put a seal upon our mouths and told us to tell nobody, even our fathers, for 20 years. He cautioned us very seriously, and I did, as he told me. There was one thing that Joseph said, which I have not related. He said, they accuse me of polygamy, of being a false prophet, and many other things which I do not now remember. But he said he, I am no false prophet. I am no imposter. I have had no dark revelations. I have had no revelations from the devil. I have made no revelations. I have not got anything up myself. The same God that has thus far dictated and directed me, and inspired and strengthened me in this work, 
gave me this revelation and commandment on celestial and plural marriage, and the same God commanded me to obey it. He said that unless I accept it and introduced it and practiced it, I together with my people should be damned and cut off from this time henceforth. And they say, if I do so, and so they will kill me. What shall I do? What shall I do? If I do not practice it, I shall be damned with all my people. If I do teach it and practice it and urge it, they say they will kill me, and I know they will. But, said he, we've got to observe it, that it was an eternal principle and that it was given to him by way of commandment and not by way of instruction. On Tuesday, March 19th, another meeting of the Council of Fifty took place. In order to counter the accusations against the prophet that Robert D. Foster had made in the presence of Williams and Eaton on the 15th or 16th of March, Joseph Smith rode with William Clayton and Alexander Niebauer to seek secure a statement from Foster's wife. According to Clayton, Joseph asked Sarah if he had ever made any indecent proposals to her, taught her the spiritual wife doctrine, or done or said anything immoral or indecent, all of the things, in essence, that her husband was accusing someone of having done recently. Sarah replied in the negative to each question. On Sunday, March 24th, Joseph preached at 10 a.m. His journal records, quote, On the stand I related what was told me yesterday by Mr. Marinus G. Eaton, that William Law, Wilson Law, Robert D. Foster, Chauncey L. Higby, and Joseph H. Jackson held a, had held a caucus designing to destroy all the Smith family in a few weeks. No doubt of concern, out of concern for the safety of Harris and Scott, Joseph Smith did not mention them as additional informants. On March 26th, historians agree that Joseph Smith's last charge was given in a Council of Fifty meeting, as reported by Elder Orson Hyde. Could the encounter of Denison with the Twelve have taken place on the day of the last charge meeting with the Council of Fifty? Unfortunately, he was somewhat imprecise in his remembrance of when the encounter, encounter occurred. He said, quote, it was a few months after the conspiracy meeting. Perhaps it was two or three weeks. I do not now remember. I did not rivet dates on my mind. The two or three weeks afterward time frame is roughly compatible with March 26th. If we assume for a moment that is the case, because it is known that the Council of 50 meetings starting, started at 9 a.m. that morning, the encounter with Denison would have had to have taken place prior to that time. The need for some specific instruction of the Twelve prior to the morning system with the entire council does not seem implausible. Moreover, it would have been prudent for the attendees of such a confidential meeting to stagger their arrivals so as not to attract undue attention. If, the Den if Denison's statement can be trusted in this regard, Joseph Smith stood on the second floor landing of the red brick store with the Twelve gathered around him sometime before 9 a.m. on March 26 and declared to Denison, Today I am going to roll this kingdom off my shoulders onto the shoulders of these, my brethren of the Twelve. But the problem with this date is that Denison remembers having been told that the water was needed for endowments. However, Ronald Esplin and other historians who have studied the matter are convinced that no ordinances were performed that day, before or during the Council of Fifty meeting. The other possibility is that Denison's remembrance coincided with the meeting of endowed saints a few months after the conspiracy meeting. Um, as, as is in one version of Denison's statement. In this case, the most likely date that suggests itself is Sunday, May 12th. Endowments were given on that day, which would have required hauling water up to the second floor of the bread, red brick store. Also, Bathsheba W. Smith's remembrance of the instruction Joseph Smith gave that day seemed to resonate with the theme of Denison's report. Quote from Bathsheba, in the years, year 1844, a short time before the death of the prophet Joseph, it was my privilege to attend a regular prayer circle meeting in the upper room of the, over the prophet's store. There were present at this meeting most of the twelve apostles, their wives, and a number of the other prominent brethren and their wives. On that occasion, the prophet arose and spoke at great length, and during his remarks, I heard him say that he had conferred upon the heads of the twelve apostles all the keys and powers pertaining to the priesthood, and that upon the heads of the twelve apostles the burden of the kingdom rested, and that they would have to carry it." End of quote. Andrew F. Ehat describes that meeting as follows. Sunday evening, May 12th, this would be the only occasion where all the 12 in Nauvoo and the others who constituted the 24 couples and about 17 individuals who received their endowments, where all the members of the Holy Order or anointed quorum were not only invited to attend, but were expected to attend. The room was packed that evening. 
No other endowment conferral and prayer meeting was conducted with the entire body of the Twelve available in Nauvoo in the following weeks of the Prophet's life. Most of the Twelve and the elders of the Holy Order, or the Council of Fifty, left for the East a few days earlier. later. It was held at 3 p.m., with the endowment lasting about one and a half hours, and the Prophet would naturally have been discussed with Apostle William Smith and Council of Fifty members John P. Green and Alma W. Babbitt, the charge that he had given to the Twelve, during the full, their fullness of the priesthood ordinance, as well to the Twelve within the Fifty on the 26th of March, 1844. The brethren universally say he spoke of it many times, but they never interpreted the rest he was going to as an indication of the nearness of the, his martyrdom. They likened this, holding of their eyes, as the same as the apostles had of Jesus' departure, going to the Father. End of quote from Ehab. Ehad also raises a third possibility, Namely, that Denison hauled water for Joseph and the Twelve, both on March 26th and May 12th, and that he conflated the two occasions into one, making it possible that his remembrance, remembrance of the dating of two or three weeks afterward and a few months afterward were both right. On March 26th, drinking water for the large crowd of attendees would have been needed, and members of the Twelve could have arrived early to be there when Joseph told Denison, this day I'm going to roll the kingdom off my shoulders. On May 12th, he could have hauled needed water for the endowments of that day. These three options for the dating of Denison's remembrance, March 26, May 12th, or both, will be the subject of further reflection between now and the publication of this work next year. Now to our epilogue and conclusion. There's one circumstance in the account of Denison Lot Harris that I've left out. After Joseph Smith revealed his intentions to Denison about the transfer of responsibility to the Twelve, telling him, you are the only witness on the earth to what I am about to do. I wanted you as a witness, and I've been waiting for you. The prophet turned to Brother Brigham and said, when this temple, the Nauvoo temple, is finished, will you see to it the giving of this young man his endowments as I will give them to you today? Brother Brigham answered, I will. Brother Joseph, Brother Joseph remarked again, I request you to do it. Brother Brigham promised in his firm way that he would do it, end of quote. You will remember the challenging circumstances and daunting deadlines under which Brigham Young and others labored to finish the temple and endow as many as possible of the thousands of saints in Nauvoo before their departure to the West. I've always loved President Young's account of the first, last few days they gave these ordinances while at the same time rushing to leave Nauvoo. Let's look at a piece of the church video dramatizing Brigham's account. Tuesday, February 3rd, 1846. Notwithstanding that I had announced that we would not attend to the administration of the ordinances, the house of the Lord was thronged all day, the anxiety being so great to receive, as if the brethren would have us stay here and continue the endowments until our way would be hedged up and our enemies would intercept us. Brothers and sisters, this is not wise. To remain here may put our very lives in danger. We will yet build more temples and have further opportunities to receive the blessings of the Lord. In this temple, we have been abundantly rewarded if we receive no more. 
It is my intention now to go home. Hitch up my wagons and be off. I recommend the same for you. I walked some distance from the temple, supposing the crowd would disperse. But on returning, I found the house filled to overflowing. Come, my friends. Let us go in. Looking upon the multitude, and knowing their anxiety as they were thirsting and hungering for the word, I continued at work diligently the house of the Lord. 295 persons received ordinances. This story has great personal meaning for anyone among the thousand or more during those last few days who received their endowments in Nauvoo and for their descendants. Especially has great meaning for those who have some relationship to Dennis and Lot Harris. After President Young relented and reopened the temple and a huge swell of ordinances were performed over the next two days, 512 people were given their endowments on February 6th, and on the next and last day in which the temple ordinances were administered in Lavu, over 600 received them. Dennison said that, quote, Brother Young fulfilled his promise to Joseph Smith that he would make sure Dennison received his endowments. Poignantly, he was endowed not only on the final day, but also as part of the ninth and last company that completed that ordinance sometime after midnight in the wee hours of the 8th of February. Although we'll never know the full story of what happened, I've always liked to imagine that a day or two prior to the exodus from Nauvoo, Brigham remembered his promise to the prophet and sent Brother Milo Andrews to invite Dennison to be part of that final session in Nauvoo. The invitation would have been a sweet and tangible recognition of the Lord's gratitude for Denison's courage and faithfulness during the most perilous and the most glorious period of Joseph Smith's life. And to Brigham, it was one more way to demonstrate his determination to carry out all the measures of the prophet Joseph. As part of Elder Parley P. Pratt's proclamation, he described the aftermath and the legacy of the last charge, quote, after giving the 12 a very short charge to do all things according to the pattern, Joseph's pattern, Joseph Smith quietly surrendered his liberty and his life into the hands of his bloodthirsty enemies, and all this to save the people for whom he had so long labored from threatened vengeance. Thus nobly fell our worthy founder and leader in the very bloom of life, and thus the responsibility of bearing off the kingdom triumphantly now rests upon the twelve. He has organized the kingdom of God. We will extend its dominion. He has restored the fullness of the gospel. We will spread it abroad. He has laid the foundation of Nauvoo. We will build it up. He has laid the foundations of the temple. We will bring up the top stone with shouting. He has kindled a fire. We will fan the flame. He has kindled up the dawn of a day of glory. We will bring it to its meridian splendor. He was a little one and became a thousand. We are a small one and will become a strong nation. Continuing, Elder Pratt wrote, in short, he quarried the stone from the mountain. We will cause it to become a great mountain and fill the whole earth. While the testator lived, the testament was not of full power. All that was done was preparatory. The chaos of materials prepared by him must now be placed in order in the building. 
The laws revealed by him must now be administered in all their strictness and beauty. The measures commenced by him must now be carried into successful operation. End of quote from Elder Pratt. Though at first, after the martyrdom, Brigham Young had sorrowfully wondered whether Joseph Smith had taken the keys of the kingdom with him at his death, he was soon fired through with a burst of inspiration that told him all was well. Quote, bringing my hand down upon my knee, I said, the keys of the kingdom are right here with the church. All those keys of the priesthood, including the last and most sacred key of the sealing power that was specifically conferred upon Brigham Young, have continued with the First Presidency in the Twelve to the present day. Andrew E. Hatt summarizes the enduring legacy of 26th of March, 1844, quote, John Taylor, successor to Brigham Young as president of the church, received an admonition from the Lord for the church to, quote, fear me and observe my laws, and I will reveal unto you from time to time through the channels that I have appointed everything that shall be necessary for the future development and perfection of my church, for the adjustment and rolling forth of my kingdom, and for the building up and establishment of my Zion, end of quote. The channels had been appointed. The process process of succession was set. The flow of revelation has continued. This is the continuing influence of Joseph Smith's last charge. Never ever again, Elder Gary E. Stevenson of the Twelve has declared, do we have to question, where are the keys? I bear my testimony to you that the keys of the priesthood that were given to Joseph Smith and to Brigham Young by divine messengers and passed down through much sacrifice, are with the church today. I treasure and look forward to the revelations that will be given us in the coming days to help us to prepare for the coming of our Lord that President Nelson has emphasized and heralded and worked so hard to achieve in the accomplishment of the work of salvation for those on both sides of the veil. May we do our part and carry this message and this testimony forward is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me go ahead and put Lisa Branch on the screen for us. Our dear Our Father, dear Father in, heaven, in heaven, I thank you for this opportunity to um, learn tonight of courageous and faithful Our dear Father, examples in church history. We are grateful for a prophet. We pray God bless President Russell M. Nelson. We thank thee for the restored gospel. We are thankful for are the Book of Mormon. For, the for, um, for the priesthood. We pray for courage and faithfulness in our lives. Help us to learn from these courageous examples in church history and apply these lessons to our lives. We're grateful for the Interpreter Foundation and the um, the, the faithful studies and um, academia that, that help us to strengthen our faith. We pray for um, thy spirit to be in our lives, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.